Okay, so uh, we are here at uh, the Earth at Risk conference in San Francisco. I'm sitting here with Dr. Uh, Guy McPherson. Um, I like to call him Dr. Doom, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, this event, uh, its goal is to craft a game-changing response to address the converging crises that we all face. Um, so, um, Dr. McPherson, in your eyes, what are the crises? crises? Um, what should the what could or should the response look like, and what is your personal focus at this time? You might need to ask me those questions again because okay. I tend to be forgetful. Okay. What are, what are the crises? Well, there are a variety of crises, all underlain by civilization, and I call them predicaments, not problems, because they have no politically viable response. So, for example, we're in the midst of the sixth great extinction. It is proceeding far more quickly than any of the previous five ex great extinction events. That's underlain by industrial civilization. We're in the midst of abrupt climate change. That's underlain by industrial civilization. We're in the midst of human population overshoot. That's underlain by civilization and most notably by industrial civilization. We're in the midst of fouling the air and dirtying the water and, and eroding the soils from the planet into the ocean. All of those phenomena are underlain by industrial civilization. So those are the predicaments we face. And you're gonna to have to remind me what your next question was. Okay, so uh, just, just going back to your response here. So um, I, I think it's very clear that we're heading towards a, a very dark place. You've made some predictions that it's quite likely that there'll be no humans on this planet by 2050. Is this something that you're convinced of, or do you think this is just a, a you know a, a, a possibility? How firm are you in the convictions that we are truly on this horrific pass, uh, path towards our own annihilation? Well, we've never experienced a planet with humans on it at three and a half degrees centigrade above baseline, above the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when there were about 280 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere when it's about 14 degrees centigrade global average temperature, or about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. We're now at about 56 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, only one, roughly one and a half degrees above that pre-industrial baseline, and already we've triggered more than three dozen self-reinforcing feedback loops on the climate front. An, an analysis of one of those indicates that due to exponential release of methane into the atmosphere, we're headed for a temperature of a more than 4 C above baseline by 2030 and more than 10 C above baseline by 2040. In addition, Paul Beckwith, one of the world authorities on methane release from the Arctic Ocean, indicates that we could experience an abrupt rise in temperature up to 6 degrees centigrade within a decade. Yep. That's the kind of abrupt event that we're in the midst of here, right. and I don't see how humans survive a planet yep. that is essentially lacking in food because we're, we're killing the entire planet from yeah. the phytoplankton to all the land plants. Yeah. So I know there's a common thread in, in your narrative that, that uh, yes, things are, are bad and yes, things are going to get worse, but that's no reason for us not to, to fight back. Um, uh, and, and I absolutely agree with that. What does that, that fight in your eyes look like? What, what should our response be? Uh, you know, as, as, as citizens of this country, but as citizens of this planet, what does that response look like and how aggressive uh, and, and quickly does, does that response need to happen? Well, I, I, I propose a couple of um, actions that we can take. Uh, first, I think that what we do should be rooted in love, rooted in love for each other and love for the living planet. And if we actually love each other and love the living planet, then I think we should be trying to maintain habitat for our species and many others for as long as possible. That leads me directly to dismantling industrial civilization, uh, which, is, which is much of the focus or the, or the topic of this meeting, Earth at Risk. And there are myriad ways to do that. There are thousands of things every individual can do to participate in the, in the process of dis, as dismantling in industrial civilization. Um, Keith Farnish's 2011 book, Underminers, which is online at underminers.org, lists myriad 
strategies for dismantling or undermining industrial civilization. Derek Jensen's work, of course, has been pivotal in pointing us in that direction with several of his books. So what individual acts do you want to take? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any control over that. I know what I do. I know how I, how I approach um, above ground and below ground actions. And as with Fight Club, the first rule of below ground action is we don't talk about below ground action. Right? Uh, I've heard you mention that, that you believe, and I believe this to be true as well, that the United States government is very much aware, as is the other governments of the world, very much aware of the, the course that humanity is on. Um, and uh, do you agree with that statement? Uh, and, and, and if that's the case, uh, aren't they really guilty at, in, in a profound way of, in a sense, crimes against humanity? Um, yes and yes. It's difficult for me to imagine that world leaders in, in the political arena don't know what I know. I'm just connecting the dots. In, in fact, they have known about the information I have at my disposal for far longer than I have. We now know that all Microsoft products, every keystroke you ever type on a Microsoft product goes immediately to the NSA. And that's been the case since the year 2000. So every keystroke typed by every scientist is accessible by the U.S. government. So of course they know what I know and they've known it for longer than I've yep. known it. Yep. So are they guilty of genocide? Yes, of course. Uh, is, is there any doubt about that? I mean, the, the current president and, and Nobel Peace Prize winner is responsible for bombing seven Muslim countries since he took office. That's of the 14 Muslim countries we, we bombed since 1980. You can see where this is going, it's ratcheting up. And that doesn't include the Philippines, which has a significant Muslim pop population. So, you, you know, the last decent man in the Oval Office based on his daily actions was probably Jimmy Carter. And he's known, as many presidents, presidents are, for the doctrine that bears his name. The Carter Doctrine says, with respect to the Middle East, that's our oil over there. And we'll do whatever it takes to get our oil from under their sands yeah. into our pipelines. Right. And, yeah. and with all the genocide that brings. Yeah. Uh, the United States government, or the United States military, if I'm not mistaken, is the biggest consumer of oil and gas on the planet. And, and it seems as though a lot of the wars that obviously have happened you know, since World War II have all been, including World War II, have been about oil and our thirst and consumption. In fact, our entire society, our entire civilization is built on fossil fuels. And the second you start waning yourself off fossil fuels, your economy starts to suffer and people really have to start making sacrifices. Do you think Americans, people in general, are willing to make sacrifices in their lives to create the kind of change that's necessary or or are we just sleepwalking towards oblivion and that, that we really don't have what it takes to stand up and fight back? I think we as individuals, many of us, and we as small groups or communities have what it takes to fight back, to make the relevant changes. Do we as a society? No. We're, we're literally sleep walking into a future and that future is a, a brick wall or, or a cliff that we're going to fall off of. And we, for the most part, we're relatively wealthy, we're relatively white in this country. And that combination is lethal to everybody else on the planet, and it's going to be lethal for us as well. Right. Right. We, we have this, this notion of privilege that we don't even recognize, this, this idea that we're entitled to all we have, right. and so we're unwilling to give those things up. Um, what would you say, I interviewed Dennis Kucinich a year or so ago, and I asked him to speak to the youth of America, to speak directly to the kids, um, because it seems to a certain extent, for one, we're really putting their, their lives in, in jeopardy with our actions, but it also real change could come from the younger generations. What would you say uh, to the youth, not of just this country, but the youth of, of the world at this point in time? Two things, live here now, pursue your passion, you know, the, the sort of message that I've adopted over the course of the last year or so is to do what you love, pursue what you're passionate about, and then if you want to try to do something to preserve habitat for humans and non-human species, 
work outside of the system because the system will not approve of this, work outside the system to dismantle the system. Most people I talk to think they're going to change the system from the inside. There's a Stephanie McMillan cartoon that has a chicken with a cockroach in its belly, and the cockroach is saying, I'm going to change the system from the inside. Right. The cockroach is already dead. Right. It just doesn't know it yet. Right. It's, it's operating within a genocidal system yep. and trying to change that system, but the system is irredeemably fundamentally corrupt and can't be turned around. Yep. Um, I've been an activist for quite a few years, and I've been to my share of protests uh, out on the streets, although I find them to be relatively ineffective because I just don't think really anybody is listening, to be honest with you. Do you think, do you think there's any viability of people really getting out on the streets, or does it need to be through individual choices and, and changing the way that we think and live? I think we must do what we can do, regardless of how many other people follow. And I don't know, I cannot predict how many people are going to follow and how many people are going to get on board and whether a mass mass action will result from individual actions. Right. But well, that doesn't negate the responsibility for us taking those actions. Well, that's, that's our goal as a nonprofit media organization. Our goal is to raise the awareness and the consciousness of the masses, and that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tall, tall order, um, but that's what we're trying to achieve. And so I very much appreciate you sitting down with us today and talking about these, these uh, unfortunate uh, issues, but um, is there anything else you want to add in, in closing? Sidetrack can do the non-attachment for the youth. Yes. Live, right? No, no, we can, do, we can edit this all day long. So maybe answer the question yeah. again yeah, about yeah, yeah. the non-attachment. Right. So for, so for youth in particular, but all of us, really, I think we should do what's right. And this is a notion rooted in Buddhist philosophy, that do the right thing and don't be attached to the outcome. Because the outcome probably is not going to be what you desire. Right. Hope and fear are the twin sides of expecting a different outcome future. And so let's lose the attachment to any particular outcome and do what's right for the other species with which we share this wondrous planet. Yep. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Clark. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Guy. Um, I gave you my card already, right? Yes, you did. Okay, and we're friends on Facebook. I'll send you a link, obviously, to anything that we do. Awesome. Um, I'm going to try to put together one piece for the whole event, uh, but I'll probably also put a separate piece together of both your presentation on stage and our interview. So okay. I'll, so oh, that'll be awesome. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much, Clark. I appreciate it. A real pleasure meeting you, too. And I like your idea about love. I have a homeless friend of mine that walks around, um, and he has a placard on his shirt that says love. And his entire mission at this point in time is to spread this concept of love. He feels like that's the only thing that can save us, is if we don't start loving each other and act lovingly in, in, in our, in our, in our you know, in our communities, that there is right. no hope. And he only, only love remains. Only love as remains. I wrote a couple of years ago at Nature Bear's Are you local? Uh, we're in Los Angeles. Oh, you are? Yeah, we are drove you, up. Are you going to be up here for uh, Thanksgiving? Um, I'm going to be with my family in Los Angeles. Oh, you are? Okay.